Good morning um, and welcome to our session, which we have called Sound Logic. Why making broadcasters podcasters makes sense. Built on the foundations of radio, podcasts connect, don't they? They make you laugh, they make you cry, you know, but crucially, they are authentic and they connect with listeners and audiences. So I am delighted to be joined by three broadcasters and podcasters from Global. Anna Whitehouse, who is presenter at Heart and presenter of Dirty Mother Pucker podcast. Lewis Goodall, who is LBC radio presenter, has a show on a Friday evening on LBC and is also co-host of The News Agents, which is the UK's biggest daily news podcast and Mylin Class, presenter on Classic FM and Smooth, and whose podcast has launched today. They don't teach this at school. So welcome, all of you. Thank you. Miley, let's start with you. Why, um, why do you think podcasting is different to being a radio host? And do you? How have you found the experience? Well, my podcast is about four hours old. Because <laughs> what I figured is we need another podcast. Um, how, I, how do I find it different? I think that there are just two mechanisms, really. So radio sort of is an accompanying uh, mechanism where you can inform. I, I like to give um, takeaway, especially on Classic FM. So you, somebody might be sitting in the pub and say, did you know List had so much fan mail uh, to, to cut his hair? He used to give uh, his dog's hair away instead. You know, you've got to take home and then people will listen the next time round. Podcasts for me, uh, where you stretch your legs out a little bit and you can just grow and... Uh, experience the subject matter further, um, get to know people in a more detailed way and hear a different side. Um, I think that's very much, uh, it's almost like an indulgence, that time that you get with that person. So I equally love both. Um, I'm coming up to my 18th year now for classic and uh, my eighth year for smooth. At the same time, the podcast arena for me, I felt that I've been bolstering everyone else's podcasts. <laughs> 5.3 million, the last one got that we did. It did. Um, and I felt it was time now just to be able to grow what I've done with my book, which was Life Hacks, and then actually find out, well, who actually taught you Amanda Holden, Amir Khan, Sophie Ellis Bexter, you know, Matt Lucas, to tell me about what actually makes you tick. And, and it, it just seemed to be a perfect gap in the market to do so. Who would have thought so with all those podcasts out there? It's but I found one. Room for more. And you've been on Heart Breakfast this morning with Amanda huh? Holden and Jamie Theakston yeah. to launch the podcast and you're going on to Dirty Mother Pucker to record <laughs> with Anna later on this afternoon. And one of the things that you do, Anna, with your podcast is you it's a very personal space isn't it dirty mother pucker yeah it's become more of a therapy room um so i don't have to pay for therapy um <laughs> that's why i'm coming back again. yeah <laughs> it's basically that um yeah i think i loved what you said mylene about the way sort of radio and podcasts are slightly different radio for me is kind of like the high five the right let's go you might be washing up the quick moments to keep people going whereas I think with podcasting, I like it to be sort of you're having a cup of tea, you sit down with you with a mate, you're empathising, and there's a bit more space. Uh, I think I was saying to you earlier, I've had quite a public uh, divorce announcement this week, um, which was really nice to be able to expand on in podcast form with my ex-husband and actually give nuance and detail that wouldn't really land on a one minute link on heart uh, and followed by Bruno Mars, marry me. Um, so it's, it's trying to find, I think, space for the same content, but delivered differently. And yes, we do cry, we laugh extremely. Uh, it's peaks, it's troughs, it's highs and lows on the podcast. I would say radio connects, it's emotive. Um, but, you know, it is a little bit more restrictive because no one wants me banging on about my husband who didn't do the washing up and it really annoyed me. And, uh, yeah, now Amy Winehouse, uh, text 82122 if you want divorce advice. <laughs> because you give a lot of yourself, though, and you do have that space, and you, you and Matt have done an episode of Dirty Mother Pucker, it really builds a sense of trust from listeners doesn't it and you have a real community like lots of podcasts have this kind of very you know passionate 
fan base and audience and they are absolutely fanatical about their podcast which is why it travels via word of mouth a lot isn't it but you particularly have built a really successful community around Dirty Mother Puck, haven't you? But they've now crossed over to my heart show. And that is the bit that has brought me the greatest joy, that I get to amplify um, my podcast, the slightly longer form. We did an episode on uh, the mum Yoon, which is a lot of group, groups of single women now coming together under one roof to raise the next generation. Uh, you'll see me there in a few weeks. Um, but to be able to say that in a very light snippet, uh, going anyone else up for the mum Yoon, uh, and then throwing forward to Lady Gaga, uh, to then go into depth about what it means, how to actually live in you know, a community of single divorced mothers. Like what's the depth of that, the highs and the lows. Um, so it's those two sort of different sides of the same coin, I suppose. Mm. It's a bit of the thing we say with the news agents, isn't it, Lewis, that it's that kind of sit back and loosen the tie that you perhaps don't get in other mediums. And that we've really kind of amplified that with the news agents, haven't we? We're really conscious of that, that there's space and there's time for that analysis. Yeah, look, I think um, one of the things in news uh, that you hear a lot um, particularly in like tr news radio shows or, or TV where I was, was before, is uh, audiences often say, uh, get really annoyed when they say, oh, well, that's all we've got time for. Because it's not true, right? I mean, like, it's actually, what's true is, is that normally with shows, if you think a show like the Today Programme or Newsnight or whatever, there's kind of furniture to it, right? There's furniture, like, we'll be for any, like a, any radio show or whatever, there's furniture to it. You know, you've got the news, you've got the travel, you've got the, you know, whatever it happens to be or the thought for the day or whatever it is. And, you know, with a podcast, a news podcast, you don't have that. I mean, it is, it is literally just a blank sheet of paper every day, which is kind of, like, exhausting, particularly if it's daily, because, I mean, the great... I mean, it's a sort of the virtue and vice with, it, with a daily news show is you're only ever as good as your last one. So you can sit there at the end of the day and go, oh, that was brilliant. And think, oh, bloody, I've got another one tomorrow. What are we going to do tomorrow? It's a sort of real sort of relentless. But if you've done one that's not so great, <laughs> you can think, well, OK, we're just moving on to the next one. But it is a blank sheet of paper every day, um, which is sort of a bit intimidating sometimes, but it's also very exciting in a way that just isn't true with traditional news forms, because there is always, even with a show like Newsnight, which is quite, um, you know, it's a bit more free, there's still sort of form and grammar to it that you have to adhere to. One of our producers at the end of the day says, we go again. We go again, exactly. The there every, is, yeah, yeah, every exactly. show. But that's something that, you know, has really led to the news agents being a success, isn't it? That there is more time, there is more space. And starting with a blank sheet of paper every day actually means that you can craft exactly what that episode is going to look like at the start of every day. And it has the most amount of meaning it can then to an audience. Yeah, look, I think that, uh, so there's two things about it. One is, is that weirdly, Actually, something slightly to my surprise that I found with a news podcast versus other, you know, more traditional types of, of, of news is that actually the bar for a podcast is much higher. Like the story threshold is much, much higher. So whereas, you know, on a traditional news show, you know, you could just do a hit for three minutes on something. To be honest, you know, you could just, you've got three hours to fill, right? You've got, to, you've got to fill the time. You know, everybody who's ever made a news program knows, what, or any type of media program knows that. But with a podcast, weirdly, I don't know whether it's about the sort of connection with the audience. I don't know what it is. But the actual bar, maybe because you have to sort of discuss it for longer, you've got to sustain it. And it's got to kind of interest you as well and, you know, your other presenters. You've got to have something to say about it. So the bar is much, much higher, um, which is sort of both good and bad. And the other thing is, I mean, I, I think one of the reasons the show has worked is just because, look, I mean, I, I always think that with traditional news broadcasting, in a way, the funny thing about it is, particularly by comparison to other media, like, I don't know, drama or sport, whatever it is, it kind of hasn't evolved for a long time. It's, you know, if you listen to a news show, you know, if you listen to the Today programme, say, which is a great programme, by the way, I've got a lot of friends on it, just in case anyone's tweeting. Um, you, know, uh, the, the, you know, you could listen to an episode of it today and it would, you could listen to one 20 years ago and it would be exactly the same. And indeed, that's what people want. They want the kind of the, the, the frequency and the regularity and the familiarity. Um, but the, I think there is a tremendous appetite out there for news told in a different way, in a different register when people want it as well. And that is what news podcasting uniquely can provide. It has other challenges in terms of telling the news, but it is nonetheless a kind of, I'm so struck by the different sorts of people who now come up to me and say, oh, I love the show. So it used to be people who were a bit older, you know, when I was at Newsnight, so it'd be people in their 50s and 60s, you know, and now it'd be people in their 20s and their 30s. And I think that that's very satisfying because it means that, you know, as we know, there is a huge appetite for news amongst younger people, but it's not necessarily told in the more traditional way as it was before. And that point about it's what people want 
when they want it. It's such an active thing to do, isn't it? Is to go into your app, listen to a podcast. It's, you know, radio is always there, isn't it? Which is always really reassuring. And But to listen to a podcast is such an active thing to do, isn't it? And I know during, you know, going back to your community that you've built around Dirty Mother Pucker, particularly during lockdown, that was something that you really lent into, wasn't it? Yeah, so um, what we tend to do and what I love is uh, that we're leading the next episode uh, tomorrow on inclusion in parenting. So my co-host, Polly, who um, isn't famous, she's got about 13 followers on TikTok. Um, and I remember pitching her to heart <laughs> and I was like, look, she's relatively unknown. And our friend said, no, unknown. <laughs> and I said, but there's a chemistry here. We've been best friends for 17 years. She's seen me through miscarriage. She's seen me through now separation. We've seen each other in sort of dodgy regional nightclubs. We have lived, <laughs> not a life, just lived. And I think it was that richness of our friendship, uh, being able to talk about our love affair, our platonic love affair, which gave other women who are feeling isolated, maybe in their own relationships even, a sense of, ah, well, that platonic is right here. And even if it's not in front of me in NCT groups, it's actually on this podcast. Anna and Polly are showing me that female friendship, platonic, is just as important as romantic. And I think that, uh, that's obviously why I'm divorced, um, but <laughs> um, it's not at all. Um, but uh, we, I said to her, well, you know, what do you want to say? You're not just uh, my co-host. You represent uh, a, my audience, our audience, because... Most of our audience don't have the following I have. You know, she calls me out when I go to the Adele concert and I'm wanging on about how annoying it was um, people having their phone in the air in a VIP area. And she's like, oh, I was at the local community hall this weekend uh, selling cakes with my mum. <laughs> she's like, get a grip, woman. And so she speaks on behalf of a lot of our followers um, and listeners. I hate followers, but our audience. And I think that creates real connection, heart, really lent into our friendship that wasn't based on celebrity, wasn't based on fame, wasn't based on any kind of pedestaling. Mm. It was based on true love and friendship. And I think that's where our community has grown. And I think you can tell the podcasts that have just had people slung together who want to just do a podcast. That for me, I'm out. Uh, it needs to have heart and it needs to have a point. It has to have purpose. Mm. I think um, in the retail industry, I'd call a podcast a considered purchase. Mm. So when you're working in radio, you can recalibrate considering what's going on in the world, what you're hearing from your live listeners, and you can just keep on moving with that. But with a podcast, you are providing a service and it's a package and you're giving that to somebody and they are trusting you to deliver it. And what I mean by that considered purchase is not until you reach the end will anybody come back to you with any kind of feedback and then you will know. And I think it's very easy to take podcasting for granted because everyone has a mic these days, like everyone has a microphone and, and uh, th thinks they're a singer. Everyone who has a pen thinks they're a writer. It's, you know, there is a talent to it and an endurance. That endurance or that longevity is what really is what tests your metal, what tests if you can do it. And the cut through of podcasts at the moment is fierce. There, it's just... It, what do you call a collection of podcasts? <laughs> it, it, Don't it, answer that. That, that. It's like a swarm. You know. And so when someone finds you and stays with you and then mentions you to someone else, it's not, like you say, a follower. Or a, it's, a, it's a friend. Mm. It is. And they're choosing to put you on. You're not that background, omnipresent sound that you can sort of click off. Although some people have said they just put it on to hear my husky voice in the background. Do they? <laughs> I get that. that I'm sorry, I, didn't know, I just want to say it. I They're like, it. I don't listen to what you say. But, um, and my dad actually made a really good point recently because he's only just got into podcasts. And I thought it was a great differentiator for who listens to what. And he said, I've been trying to get into these podcasts just because I've got one. And he doesn't really understand why I didn't become a lawyer still. Um, and uh, he was like, some of them just sound like they should just be reserved for telephone conversations among <laughs> friends. Correct. And he said, I don't really understand that. I thought that's a very good point, yeah. you know, because I think you say there's, it feels like just everyone's doing one and actually what's good and what's not. And I think there needs to be, like you said, what's your purpose, what's your point? And this is where 
uh, you know, not to pedestal the three people here, but there's a brevity of thought, there's an understanding of how to do a one minute link on air. So you've got that skill set to keep it tight, to keep the furniture in place, so that it's a pleasant listen, that it's got purpose, that you're not wasting people's time. And I thought, you know, if my dad, who's 78, is trying to get into podcasts, I made, I thought, just a very good point about what works and what doesn't. My mum, who's 53, when we launched the news agents, she said, I can't wait, what time are you on? <laughs> and I had to tell I her, I had to, I had to tell her, I had to explain, it took her quite a while. Did she have to, to do the parental understand. finger prod to get the app down? It took her quite a while to, to sort of get around the idea that it wasn't every day. But I think that that, and I think that is, um, I think that is a really good point about one of the differences, I think, personally, I find between strong podcasts and weaker ones, which is that um, there is a tendency, I think, with podcasts, because it is familiar, because it is conversational, because it is intimate, particularly sometimes to sort of descend slightly too much into kind of self-reference or in-jokes or kind of, which, and that's fine, and it's an easy kind of road to go down, but it's got to be balanced between, you know, new listeners start here, because not everyone's going to have been listened from the same, from, from the first episode. So it, there is a balance, I think, to be struck, and, and it can be easy to go down slightly the wrong road, which is between community, which is important, and kind of being insular. And, and I think sometimes when, I think probably what, what, what you were saying there about is that you were, I was saying was, is, is sometimes when you listen to it, it's like, this conversation isn't for me. Like it's actually- It's too many it's, in-jokes. It's too many in-jokes, yeah. it's too many people having cross conversations, which I don't understand. And it can be a challenge because when you're recording it, like, you know, it can, it, it can just feel like it's just two or three of you in a room because that's what it is. Like yeah. there's nothing else. So it's something you've got to kind of guard against, I think. Yeah, that's the beauty of it, isn't it? But it's also the thing to be really wary of. It doesn't yeah. become, um, that it excludes other people. And you know, when when we were talking about who we were going to launch, they don't teach this at school with, who was that person we thought was gonna be great? That was one of the reasons we wanted to launch with Amanda, wasn't it? Because you and her are friends, you go back a long way. But the conversation that you and her have had that we've launched today brings everybody else along because there are so many shared touch points, aren't there, that you talk about with her. Um, we haven't brought this into the arena on the podcast because it was very much about Amanda. I wouldn't have my baby if it wasn't for Amanda. Well, that's going into your territory. It's <laughs> like me and John. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but Amanda is a very, very, very close friend of mine. But um, I don't take it lightly that Amanda doesn't really do podcasts. Mm -hmm. And so I asked her, and I let her think about it for a very long time, and... Um, in as much as you say about in-jokes, at the same time, you're not there to stitch someone up so you have your five-minute headline and then what? It's got to feel that's safe for both parties involved, so I don't want some gratuitous headline. And what was so lovely about Amanda is, if you're smarter with it, Amanda's everywhere that we think of, but actually when you break it down, what do we actually really know about Amanda? Mm. I can name the programmes she's on and the brand she's affiliated with and what I think I know about her relationship with Simon Cowell and, and, and so forth and the salacious gossip, but break it, break it down. What am I gonna actually be able to find out about Amanda and, and, and be able to share with those listening? And what we ended up with, I was utterly blown away and because yes, we have a commonality and we have a friendship, I was able to draw that out of her, but we didn't refer to the in-jokes. We didn't even refer to the private things that have happened between us. What I thought was incredible is I'm part of a blended family. I'm further down the line than you, and it's taken a lot to, to get to a point, but there is no blueprint for a blended family. It's the largest growing family unit there is. We don't do 2.4, or as it's now known, 1.7. Uh, it's the patchwork family, the blended family, but what starts with the blended family is failure. You're born from something that's already broken and there's no guidance for that. And to hear, Sophie ellis Bexter touched on this as well, but to hear Amanda talk about her relationship with her dad, her stepdad, who she calls her dad, that was so powerful because I can now show this to my daughters and go, look, this is somebody who has achieved everything she wanted to in life, and she had what maybe maybe someone would see as a rocky start or an unconventional one. Uh, she went through traversing that rocky terrain of the blended family, and those who are in the room who understand how hard that can be will know that actually for her to open up about that, it was actually a really special moment to have that with Amanda. She talks about, you know, she's, she's got everything in the world. What would she give to her children? I ask this, you know, what they don't teach at school. What would you give to your children? Who taught you? What are the, the tools that you would like them to have? And she said the one thing that we all want, time, because she never really feels like she has enough of it. So again, I'm sitting there thinking, God, you know, this is Amanda that 
It's a side of her I don't really get to see. And that's what's so beautiful about a podcast. It's so intimate. It's a really tricky um, form of media. A, an eyebrow raised when you're on TV can just cover a multitude of sins or mean something else. But an inflection on the radio, people can't read sarcasm. People can't read honesty. They're literally taking you at your word and you have to respect that. And that's why speaking to Amanda and having her launch it and find out these tidbits about her and the funny things. Who knew that, that Simon Cowell thinks he owns a third of our house? <laughs> I'd have flipped it the other way, to be totally honest. I think he owes her an absolute debt of gratitude. She's been the OG on that panel. But I had people say this about you. Um, really? Yeah. He does not own my house. No. <laughs> no, Simon can back off. No, I had people say the exact same thing about you, saying I didn't know she was like that. When you spoke so openly about your miscarriage experience and that clip, I don't think either of us ever knew. You were the first guest on the podcast. We had no, we had no followers, no audience. It's now got like 7 million uh, views on TikTok because you spoke so from the heart. And I had so many people saying, I didn't know her. I had no idea who she was. I've seen the Daily Mail. I've seen, you know, the jungle. I've seen the bikini. I've seen she's done incredible things on Smooth. But how much can you get across of yourself on Smooth? You can connect to an audience, but it's not really about you. And so I think podcasts give that ability, like you said with Amanda, to get to that depth, but also that commonality of experience. Uh, when you said that... Uh, point that I'll never forget and I hadn't heard it before in my life and my response was uh, as uh, open and hurt and uh, painful as I think it still would be now when you said that uh, microchimerism in miscarriage babies never really leave you the cells, cells stay with the mother and it hit me having gone through miscarriage in that moment that was in a studio that was in global that was in a very big media empire there were two women having a conversation and one of them realising that those little lives weren't actually lost. And we both broke down in the most beautiful way and that gave catharsis to millions of women and they're still messaging me. And so you could get across how wonderful Mylene Class is on Classic, but you couldn't talk about microchimerism on Smooth or Classic. You know, there's this depth to the person, but also the conversation. And so your Amanda was you to me. Gosh, thank you. It's all right. You've got a women supporting women. Do you know, <laughs> I think that just shows the power of podcasting. And actually, you're talking about the microchimerism there. It actually jumps back into your podcast as well, because as a result, it put me on a campaigning mission and I ended up changing the law about a, a, a month ago. And so we were making news headlines. And it just shows that actually the power of what Global is facilitating, understanding what it, the power of each of its presenters are and not just putting them in boxes. You're going to talk about this and you're doing this and you stay in your box. I like how you actually, even the fact you've got all three of us up here today, who you probably put us up here for the fundamental differences, but actually it's the Well, Lewis is obviously unity. coming on Dirty Mother Puck and yeah. Um, lining I can't wait. <laughs> I'll bring my mother on as well. Yeah. <laughs> now, an episode with Lewis Goodall on Dirty Mother <laughs> Absolutely listen the to The ultimate that. collab. Anna Whitehouse, Lewis Goodall, Mining Class, thank you so much for joining us today.